I'm Richard Porter. I'm Johnny Smith. And this is Smith and Sniff, a podcast in which two friends talk about cars and this week answer your questions. I promised you last week that I would um, tell you the stories about when I was chased by the police. <laughs> oh, yeah. After your, after your bulldozer shenanigans sure. last week. Because um, my stories aren't as good as yours. One of them, I, I, it's really stupid as well. I hope there's some kind of statute of limitations on this, and we're we're beyond it. Because the first one was, uh, was me and a couple of mates, and we were walking back from. We'd probably been to the pub when we were like seventeen, and someone set fire to a for sale board outside a house. What? What are those plastic? They're like estate agent boards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. plastic, and they burn like a bastard. What with it just with a lighter as people smoking? And Someone that. had a lighter on them, <laughs> and they set fire to an estate agent's board, and they go up like an absolute bastard. Wow! And then there was the classic oi, and nothing makes your heart race like an oi from across the street. Do you know what I mean? It's just that kind of uh oh. <laughs> somebody is in a quiet suburban road in Alderley Edge, which is a, you know, quite quite a fancy area near where I grew up, and we legged it, and I legged it. I can't remember why I would do this, but rather than leg it down the street, I legged it into the garden of this house and down the side of the house and hid. And then oh. I could hear somebody came out of the house oh, whose garden sh- I was hiding in and went to talk to the man who'd shouted, Oi, out on the street. And I could hear them talking. Oh. I think I heard the word police mentioned. And then, sure enough the police turned up so and you were still crouching in a flower bed or i was something. still hiding basically hiding behind a rockery oh gosh i love a rockery but yeah i know it says they don't deserve that <laughs> i ran down the side there was like it was the garden it was like it was quite a, a, a big house and it's quite a big garden and was, the, the garden just sort of ran down the side of the house um and I, so I ran into the back garden, right to the end of the back garden, and there was a fence, and it wasn't particularly high because I'm a terrible fence jumper, uh, even though well, I was 17 at the time. Did you know oh, this back then? Is this some? Oh yeah, I was well aware yeah. of my fence jumping limitations, but right, right. I, I leapt. It was, it was a low fence, so I sort of leapt up onto the top <laughs> of it and tried to scramble over. And as I did, my leg got jammed sort of up over my back by a low <laughs> branch. <laughs> And I was suddenly in this position, I'm like, I'm stuck like a shit cat on top of this fence in the pitch uh, darkness. How much much noise did the scrabbling make? Enough noise that I was then panicked that they were onto me. And so I I essentially released my own leg from behind my back (laughs) with my hand. And as soon as I did, I dropped like a stone into the garden of the house behind and sort of into a bush, which thankfully broke my fall. And then... Knowing that now I'd made Broke a lot your leg. of noise. Yeah, well, it could have done, but but I was okay. I was unharmed. And I immediately thought, I've made so much noise, fence noise as well. They're going to be onto me. So I ran down the garden of the house I'd just fallen into and out of their driveway. And, of course, I'm on a different street there. I'm on you know, a block over, effectively. And then I did what you did uh, with your escaping subterfuge. I turned my jacket inside out. Of course you did. I think it was did. a denim jacket. So I, I mean, I, mean, it I would have looked like a person with an inside-out jacket on, but I felt like <laughs> it because the, the the jacket inside was a different colour. It gave me some kind of incredible camouflage. And then I, I walked. And I think the other thing I did was I got my house keys out and I jangled them a lot, so it looked like I was almost home. Because nobody who's not almost home would would do that. So you know, I sort of thought they'll never stop me because look, I'm almost home, and no one would shit on their own doorstep by setting fire to a for sale sign <laughs> in their own neighbourhood. That would be idiotic. That because it wasn't the, my neighbourhood. The key jangling was clever. The jacket inside out was not. The key jangling I like because it's like I'm happy for, to draw attention to myself because I know I'm an innocent man. Yeah. So would a fine. guilty man do this? Jangly, jangly. Pro- pro- probably, and, but probably they, not. If they'd have stopped me. They didn't stop me, but if the, if the police had stopped me, and they did drive past, and I did shit myself, but um, if they'd have stopped me, yeah, and gone, where do you live? I'd have had to say, I live in the next town over. Oh no, my keys out then. Oh, I just like holding my keys because I've got. Are you a, pretending I've... to be nearly home so he didn't stop you? Yeah, they they but that didn't they happen. must they must know the tricks, Rich. I bet they do. They've, They've seen got it all, to they? know the tricks. There's just no way they wouldn't. My other running from the police. 
And in this case, I didn't even really run. Well, I did a bit of running, I suppose, down the gardens, but mostly it was falling away from the police. I love all this. This is great. I know, it's, but it's a bit... I'm setting a bad example. Anyway, yeah. yeah, my other... The other one where I did genuinely do a bit of running from the police also does actually involve cars a bit more because, uh, again, one night, sort of, I don't know, 17, 18, we'd been in the pub. We were walking, I think, to go and get chips. Of course you were. Chips and drinks. Down a street in my hometown that ran round the back of uh, a, a place called Lindo Common, which is an area of common land, heavily wooded with a lake in the middle. And the road around the back of Lindo Common was very quiet and there weren't many houses on it. Oh, it's where people used to smoke weed in metros. Yeah, it would have been that that sort of, yeah. <laughs> the main thing that road did, it, it provided access to the lane that went to the local tip. Um, uh, but, um, okay. but yeah, it just had a few, few sort because of, it was sort of on the edge of town. So it was almost like it was just a few cottages. And then, and then behind that, it started to get to fields and the tip. So we're walking down there and we discover a stash of traffic cones and road closure signs. What? Which have been left because the following weekend was the Wilmslow Half Marathon and they needed to close a load of roads. Oh, my god! So they, gosh. they stashed all of that ready to start closing roads the following weekend. And you're drunk. Well, this and... is manna from heaven for drunk 17-year-olds. So we went, what if we just close this road? So we did. We just put a line of cones across it and we got two road closed signs and put, you know, facing opposite directions. So whichever way you came from, you just looked like the road was closed. And then we, we went into the bushes at the edge of Lindo Common and waited. What? You, you, you actually just waited? God, you really had well, yeah, patience. Yeah, we wanted to see. Wanted to see. Well, yeah, I was thinking this road wasn't super busy, but it was busy enough that we'd, you know, we knew we'd get, a, we'd get a car coming. And sure enough, a car came along, stopped, turned around, went back the way. Come on, we were full of glee about this. It's like, ha, we've, we've just pranked somebody into thinking this road's closed. Brilliant. And so I, I don't know whether I'm going to tell you my second police story based upon the sort of relative innocence of yours. I feel like I'm I feel like I'm the you're good cop and I'm bad. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. You're good crim, bad, and I'm bad crim. If there's such a well, thing, like a lot of seventeen-year-old drunk stories. I mean, this is ultimately you know no harm, no foul, but it does involve a degree of stupidity in terms of not knowing when to quit mm. because. The next thing that happened is a car came along, stopped, and then a car came from the opposite direction and stopped. And so the two drivers got out and we could hear them and went, I thought the road was closed. Yeah, it says it's closed this way. Well, is it closed your way? No. And then they both went, oh, fucking hell. And you could tell they'd figured out what was going on. And one of them must have phoned the police because they moved the cones out of the way. And I think we went back and put the cones across the road again. Once of course you did. How, how drunk were you? Oh, uh, well, you know. Medium. As drunk as we could. We're 17, so we were as drunk as we could afford to get, which, you know, was. Not enough. We used to do that thing where we'd, we'd, we'd you'd have sort of a few pints. We used to drink Boddington's, and we'd have a few pints of Boddington's. And at the end of the night, the last pint, you couldn't quite afford a full pint of bodies, but you could afford a pint of mild, so you'd have one of those. Because it was the North. Oh! Melanie Sykes. Oh, in the advert oh, for Boddington's, yeah. I remember that. Wearing the white oh. dress. Oh, lovely. Oh, yeah. Oh. Filthy so-and-so. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, as we put the cones back across the road, the police turned up and we legged it into the darkness of Lindo Common, into the trees. Straight into the lap of a dogger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't know it. Well, rather than keep running, because I thought, that, you know, they might run after us or release a dog or something, I, I dived into a, a shallow ditch and it wasn't quite as deep as I thought. <laughs> And so, <laughs> as the police officer started shining a torch into the trees... You were just there. Well, I was far enough away to evade it, but you know there's that <laughs> thing where some animals can compress themselves really flat to get through small gaps, like mice and things like that. Oh, oh yeah, I sort yeah. of did that. I, com I, I could feel myself compressing my rib cage as flat as I could go to, to maintain a low profile in this ditch. And the police clearly couldn't be asked to go into the dark tree line to come and find us so they just moved all the cones and the signs out of the way and off they went so we went back and put the cones across the road again with the signs and oh you did it again yeah this is what i mean about oh, not you're... knowing when to quit rather than go uh oh the police are onto us we we just we went back for more and uh 
I think the second time the police arrived, they had the blue lights on, which obviously makes it feel more serious, like they're being real police now. And it's going to be more than a telling off. And at this point... Was this night? This was this was night time, right? So the blue lights, the blue lights really they, penetrate. Yes, through they the, do. Through the through yes, the dark. Yes, they do, and through dense woodland. <laughs> and I properly legged it to the other side of the common. We all scattered as well. There probably like seven or eight of us. I don't know. Quite a few of us. And we scattered. Do you still know them all? Yeah, most of them. But yeah, we properly legged it in different directions. And then I took a very circuitous route back to my parents' house as if like, I thought maybe the police were secretly following me. Um, and I, when I got back to my parents' house, two of my mates were there lurking down the side of my mum and dad's house. And I was like, what are you doing? You're going to let the police back to my house, you idiots. That's... So that's, those are the two occasions in my life when I've run from the police. Well, I did one in a car and I don't, I don't pretty, I'm not sure I should even say it. I don't know. <laughs> it's not a great. It was. It's mild, but it's still. It's still sort of outrunning the police. Is uh, is outrunning the police frowned upon? I feel like it sort of is. I was. I was heading to um, an event for the Ford Focus RS five hundred, um, which was up at Malcolm Wilson's Rally Place M Sport in Cockermouth, isn't it? Yeah, in Cumbria. Yeah. In Cumbria, and I drove. I, I set. I get off. Got off. Got up really early, and I drove up there. I booked a Ford Focus RS in to drive there, the five cylinder one in standard mm. form, and thought, oh well, when I get there, we'll drive the five hundred, and we get to go out in a rally car as well, which is quite sweet. Sweet's not a great word, is it, for a rally car? Oh, it's sweet. Sweet, it's sweet, a sweet, sweet rally car. car. Sweet car. <laughs> um, but I remember fairly close to that area in the middle of nowhere. I. I went to overtake a car on a big open road, really lovely open country road, and then I realised that there were two other cars spaced quite heavily in front of it, and then there was nothing coming the other way. I was in a Focus RS, I thought, ah, oh, just... And I overtake all, all three in one fell swoop, and I'm, I probably went beyond 70. And then as soon as I pulled in, there was a roundabout coming up, and a police car came screeching round the roundabout, went past me, pretty much did a handbrake turn, and then came, started coming at me. So I just did, I just went for the default trick. I just did left, 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 field. That, that's, that's the rule of thumb. Wait, what? Left, 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 field. That's what I do. So turned left at yeah. the roundabout, uh-huh. drove quite fast, found the first left, did another left, drove quite fast, did the next left. And then the first gateway that you can open, I opened the gate and I drove the RS into a field and then I shut the gate and I ran away from the Focus RS. <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and, that's what, and that's what I did. I did that on the way to a professional motoring journalist job. <laughs> Given that last week you told me that you hid up a tree for seven hours to avoid the police who <laughs> were after you with that bulldozer digger incident, yeah, how long did you stay away from the car before you I stayed away return? from it? I stayed away from it in this instance for 40 minutes, but let me tell you how long 40 minutes feels when you're just stood. You're just stood in a in a in a woodland area staring at um, a blue Ford Focus in the corner of a field. How far away were you? Like far enough that if you saw the police, uh, you could run. I'd say if it was a slow dog walk, it would be a ten-minute dog walk away from the car. But you kept eyes on the car the whole time, so yeah. I, if, I mean, yeah, I absolutely, arrived. yeah. I properly Usain bolted it away from the car, Twocker style, <laughs> and it looked Twocker style because it was a Focus RS. <laughs> and you parked it in a field. I parked it really quickly, neatly in the side at the corner of a field, so away from uh, as the. Carl drove past the field. It wouldn't have seen in through the gate. It was just enough. Yeah, that's my country mentality. Uh, not proud of it, but that's what I did. I once, again, this is in my hometown, but not when I lived there. I was going back there. I once um, drove away from the police, but in, in my defence, I didn't know it was the police. <laughs> I was. I came off the motorway. I was going back to Wilmslow, where I'm from, and... For no accountable reason, I was in a, a bright yellow Peugeot 306 Cabrio press car. Of course you were. I, I don't know why I had that, but um, I got off the motorway. I, you, you come off the M6, and you, I, the way I would go home is I'd wiggle across the countryside a little bit, go through Nutsford and Mobley, and, and then there's a little sort of cut through that uh, goes uh, across, across open countryside. Do you say Mobley? 
Mobbly, yes. Mobbly, okay. Mobbly. 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 It's anyway. No, no, uh, no. I just because I, 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 I know there's there's a lot of lees around that area. El, elderly, wobbly. There's loads because I, I I'm saying there's loads. I can't think of any others now that I've just put myself um, on the spot. Ashley. Ashley's nearby. That's another one. Yeah, there you uh, go. That's one. Well, yeah. I as I went onto this cut through that sort of comes off a main road, takes you across countryside, spits you out at the top end of Wilmslow near my parents' old house. And so, and it's one of my favourite roads because when it's clear, you can strop along it. It's got some nice bends. It's got a really interesting bit in it where it goes down into a little stream valley and it's also a bend and it's quite challenging. Um, and it was a lovely evening. I got the roof down in the 306. Oh, I love a, I love a 306 Cabrio. Yeah, they were all right, weren't they, as, as Cabrios go? That was when the French were doing really tasteful Cabrios. Renault mm. 19 convertible looked good as well. Mm, yeah, yes. Less. I remember not liking that. But the 306 was quite nice. And it had that two-litre engine in it, which was quite grunty. Yeah. And I'm, on, I'm, it, I'm, 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 I'm with you on that. So... I pulled off onto this cut through, which is probably, oh, I don't know, three or four miles cross country. Um, and there's no one ahead of me. And I know the road quite well. And uh, so, you know, let's have a bit of this. <laughs> no, you got, you've got to say it way more north west England than that. Have it. Have it. All right. You know. All right, our kid, let's have it. <laughs> um, and there's a bloke in a Vectra behind me. Of course. And so I started to um, up the pace. V6, though? No. Think- Again, it was like you last week. Didn't get a chance to check the badge. Other things on my mind when it turned <laughs> out that he was an policeman. But at this point, oh, I didn't know. Oh, oh, OK. I just thought, this is some sales rep. He fancies a go. He's yeah. trying to cling to my tail. Yeah. And so I'm upping the pace, upping the pace, and he's 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 lagging back a bit. And then sort of you have to break for some of the corners, and there's a narrow bridge you have to go through. You do have to keep be a bit careful as so you slow it right down and he's and he's up my ass again so i was like go through there and then there's a long straight i was like right long straight then hard on the brakes so you drop down into the stream valley now at this point he closes up again but then if you don't know the way this road sort of it, it goes uh, round to the right drops right down and then and then it's it's swooping up to the left as it crosses the little stream and as i looked in the mirror as he's coming through that tricky complex and he's gone onto the wrong side of the road you know it's like he's really trying hard and he's made a bit of a mess of it and i thought <laughs> what is he smoothing out the curve bad luck yeah but it wasn't that it was it was cocking it up and i thought bad luck mate and just as i was thinking bad luck mate the little blue lights behind his grill came on oh and sugar he pulled me in and the weird thing was he wasn't actually a traffic policeman as he told me he went yeah i'm not i'm not traffic that, that don't turn me on that no i'm crime all right, but the way you were driving there was irresponsible, all right? And oh. I went, okay, yeah. And, and he went, do you know how fast you were going? And I went, look, I'm sorry, I don't. I wasn't looking at the speedometer, and this isn't my car, thinking, oh, well, you know, actually, I probably shouldn't have said that. He completely ignored me saying, this isn't my car, and just and just went on with, you know, I mean, there could have been someone coming the other way, and there's arse riders and all sorts around here. You shouldn't be doing this. Oh, he didn't fixate on it? Because that's always the first one I get asked if I'm in a press car, and I haven't been pulled very often in my years. But it's usually, is this your car? And you go, no, it's not. And then they go, oh, yeah. whose car is it? And you go, oh, it's Audi's car. And they think you're being cocky. They, it gets yeah. the back up. They go, what do you mean it's Audi's car? Went, well, Audi UK own it. And they look at you like, oh, here we go. You know, like they're almost getting ready on the trigger for the radio to radio in <laughs> for backup. Oh, we've got a cocky one here. Come on. Yeah, this guy, not biting. And he was only, that's the thing. My reading of the situation, particularly in retrospect, is he did fancy a little bit of a, of a, a you know, a tussle. He wanted a bit. He's a bit of dice dicing with a little with a kid because I was twenty three, twenty four at this point. He fancies a tussle with a kid in a brightly coloured convertible car, and then he's had enough and he decides, oh, now now I'm going to teach the kid a lesson by putting the shits up him. But I, I have no intention of prosecuting him whatsoever because that would just be paperwork. <laughs> And he's on his own as well, so he's got no colleague with him to corroborate anything. So he just took my name and address in a sort of slightly feeble way that a teacher might if they caught you in the pub on a Saturday. I mean, if he put the blue lights on and then I'd floored it away from him, I, you know, I think that becomes a whole different compartment of illegality. But it was still, it was still a bit, a bit squeaky bum for a moment. But yeah, this isn't my car. Yeah, well, the thing is, that was irresponsible. Are you not going to ask? <laughs> I didn't say that. Hey, I've, um, I've got. One, two. I've written down four questions from social media for us. I have some questions. I saw. 
I wrote some down and everything. Quite two organized. two people on Twitter asked mm. direct questions of us in, yeah. in the past few days, and I wrote them down as well because I thought, well, well, wouldn't that be that? Would seems like a, a, a polite seems like thing a professional to thing to do, right? Yeah. Go on, you yeah. um, you ask one first. Well, the one is from a chap called Sam Philpot on Twitter, and it says, this is good, I like this one. This is your best and worst smelling cars that you've owned. <laughs> and Because I, 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 he put you've owned, because I've been in some cars which smell absolutely terrible, but I didn't own them, so yeah. different conversation. Mm. Although one of them was the person in the car, not the car itself. So that's, um, but the I'm going to say my best smelling car mm. was um my jag xj40 that i had the four liter sovereign 1990 sov mm. and that's because i had it completely retrimmed in it's something called norga hide which is like high <laughs> high, high end vinyl yes, and I, uh, I and know norga hide. you know norga hide and it smelt of a combination of that maguire's Mag- kind of vinyl and plastic valet liquid and i don't know maybe three magic trees and that concoction in there was just an an absolute cauldron uh amazing i actually really every time i got in that car it smelled so clean almost suspiciously clean that Mm. i quite liked it and then my worst smelling car by a country mile was the nissan laurel i bought a 1987 nissan laurel for 2.4 1987 yeah that's Is right. that a straight six in those straight six manual oh yeah it was a manual and I th- i'm sure i've told you this story but i only bought that car on a complete whim because i there were no trains running back from nottingham one <laughs> sunday and, and i and i was really pissed off and let's i just be honest though we could fill a 12 part hour long podcast series with cars you've bought on a whim Oh yeah, absolutely. That's part of the charm of of it all, I think. But that particular car, yeah, I just thought I, I picked up um, I picked up um, a paper, and it just said Nissan Laurel. Uh, what it was one owner, Nissan Laurel, one owner, six hundred pounds. And the car was an eighty seven. What year was this that you bought it? Uh, Two thousand and four. Oh, was it was it crusty? It it. It had been paint. It was a white car, and it had been someone had tried to body colour all of the plastics, and it hadn't gone, <laughs> it hadn't gone right. So it had sort of slightly. Um, what's that condition people have where their hands flake, um, flakes of skin off their hands? Basically, it had psoriasis of the wing mirrors, the bumpers, the front grille, and a couple of other areas. So it looked way more ill than it was. It was actually a very nice car. And I bought it off a guy who's who's late. It, it it was his late father's, and he said, "Look, it's in really good condition, and it's on the button, and it drives really well." And he did say, but he leant forward. He went, "But I must warn you, he 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 always had his dog in the car, and it does smell of a dog." And I kind of went, well, "How how bad can it be?" Honestly, I opened the door. I uh. opened the door, and it was like seventeen rugby players kit bags have been left on a hot radiator oh my god um <laughs> i mean honestly like i had to squint a little bit when i sat in it, it went bloody hell i mean the upholstery was mint but it had a cocker spaniel in it every day of its life and the cocker spaniel regularly jumped in a river and then got back in the car you know on the way back from the walk so it stank and I bought it anyway, four hundred and fifty sheets. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it and it drove really well, but it stank. Bloody and did the stank. smell! Is that was the smell fixed in place? It didn't go as the dog was no longer in it. No, sadly. I mean, I steam cleaned it. I you know, on summer days, I opened all four doors and left them open for like twelve hours. Um, That's what a mate trees. of mine did. Yeah. Um, one of my best mates at school got a free car when he was seventeen. But it was an orange Ford Capri <laughs> with, you know, a lot of cars of that era and before. they get to a certain age and they would suddenly have a black tide mark where someone had applied anti-rust paint over the bodges they'd oh, done yeah. to fill in the sills where they'd gone frilly. So it had, a, it had a black tide mark around it like a boat. 
badly masked. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you mean. Because this was, I think, a, a 1985 Capri, and this no, in fact, maybe even earlier, 83 or 84, and it was, and this was in 1990 or two. So, so no, nobody that old, cared about that just, car. Just, yeah. Oh God, worth it. Was anymore. given away. It was my mate's neighbour, the old man who lived next door to his family. Uh, I think it, well, he was giving up driving because he was he was very old and his eyesight was going. And he just gave away the Capri. Just went, do you want a car? And my mate's dad went, well, yeah, because our, you know, our Mark's learning to drive, so that would be fantastic. Our and Mark, brilliant, so regional. So, yeah, I mean, actually, the, the, his parents are quite posh. They probably wouldn't have said our Mark, but I'm just I'm regionalising it because this story's set in the northwest. Um, but the old man was a heavy smoker, and a heavy smoker of like those old man fags that are, you know woodbines or something that that's just pure no tar under the age of yeah pure tar they drip the ends drip of those cigs yeah <laughs> don't they <laughs> they're that they're that horrible <laughs> but maybe that's how he sealed the the sills with black he just breathed out on them and they were <laughs> sealed in tar I can so imagine him car... being like a, a British version of the smoking man from the X Files driving in an orange <laughs> Capri <laughs> with the windows up. <laughs> But set in Cheadle Hume, and yeah. um, so the car, the, the the old man just went. No, you just take it. So my mate's dad just sort of you know walked round next door, and, and just had it, and just drove it back round onto their drive. And my mate got home and was like, oh, I can't believe he's actually given us this car. And my mate's dad went, Mark, you cannot drive that car unless you do it naked. Because I will not have you back in the house after, and, and it smelt so badly of smoke. That as soon as you, you even opened the door, it made all your clothes smell of smoke forever. Oh it was that potent. Yeah. So what they they did all sorts to the interior of that car, including like you leaving the doors open, just leaving for it days. sitting there all day for weeks, just trying to air it out. And they finally, it's still you still got the tinge, but you know, free car is free car. So yeah, um, yeah. Hard to complain, but yeah, it was a bit. It was a bit stinky inside, forevermore. It's funny you should mention a Capri because someone actually asked a question about a Capri. Did they? A chap called um, yeah, a chap called Four Legs Good. That's obviously not his name. He's on Twitter or at Welford Tim. <laughs> He's put Capris. <laughs> no, I don't think his name is Four Legs Good. Capris. Cool then, now or never. Uh, were they cool? I don't remember Capri's being cool at any point where our lives overlapped. So I like yeah. when they stopped making Capri's, 87, 88, yes. something like that. 87, yeah, 86, 87, yeah. I think. So I was 12 then, and Capri's by then were really uncool. Uh, but yeah. I don't ever remember thinking they were super cool in the... Actually, no, that's not true. Because one day... In villages they were cool, in rural maybe. places where obviously trends took a bit longer to switch over. No, do you know, I've just remembered something. It would have been what? 1981, I think, when the Capri 2.8 injection came out. Yes. And I remember this very vividly. I would have been six. and I was in the back of the car with my dad driving along in his Talbot Solara, it would have been at that point. Solara, Solara, I still laugh. It's so crap. <laughs> and a few cars ahead of us, my dad spotted... There was a brand new Capri 2.8 injection. Never seen one before. And I remember my dad actually saying, oh, Richard, look up there. There's one of the new Capri 2.8 injection. It has fuel injection. He said that. Yeah. See, my dad was an engineer, so he was into all this sort of stuff. And this is where my car disease comes from. And <laughs> I remember him saying, it has, it has fuel injection. So the engine works a little bit differently. And I didn't really know what he meant. But I remember trying to sort of sniff the air. To see, I, I, for some reason, I imagined in my six-year-old brain, I imagined that, that because the engine worked differently, that the air would smell different coming out of this Capri because it was somehow special and better. And I thought that was quite cool. That's amazing. So maybe they were cool in 1981. They would have been on choke less. And uh, yeah, I see, I think 90s, the Capris were deeply uncool in the 90s. Oh my God. Well, do you know what? Two of my mates, two of my mates had Capris as their first cars. And they both got absolutely... Ribbed. Rinsed for it. Yeah. Well, so one, 
it was this friend of mine, Mark, who got a free Capri from the old smoking man next door. <laughs> free the Capri. One, <laughs> free Capri. Come and get your free Capri. Free club, free Capri. Still not going. Um, my other mate, Brycey, his dad, <laughs> he was learning to drive. And he was the, f- he was the oldest in our year. So he was the first person to learn to drive because he got driving lessons for his 17th birthday. But both his parents' cars were automatics. Oh, okay. And he wanted to learn to drive manual. And his dad went, well, look, I'll buy you a cheap car. And we were a bit like, your dad's going to buy you a car, you bastard. What do you think he's going to get you, Nova or Fiesta? What what are you getting? And my my mate's dad used to drink in one of the pubs in town with a a, a local used car dealer and he basically just went in there and went right what's the cheapest trading you've got in stock and this guy went oh have i got a deal for you and it was a it was a blue capri 1.6 l oh they were so basic were so basic and the thing was it was like we gave him loads of shit but on the other hand it's like he passed his test and then he was able to drive us to the pub and things so in fact it, the ribbing was controlled a little bit to make sure we didn't piss him off too much that he wouldn't drive us around. And that lasted for, I think, two weeks or so after he passed his test. And then um, he floored it out of a damp junction, uh, <laughs> slithered across the road, smashed head on into the side of a lorry, what? bounced back oh. across the road and into a hedge. And, and that, that was, was Capri it. dead. Yeah. When did Capri start becoming cool again? I think it's that whole thing of they, 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 they were worthless, they disappeared... And then people started to miss them and went, God, I haven't seen a cheesy Capri for ages. I've got to speak fairly carefully because my wife's dad had, I think, two Capris. So in their early years, she said that was their family car, which I love because, like, how many, like, coupes do you have as a family car anymore? But Never. Um, you just wouldn't, Never, would you? ever. Just, I mean, never. Just wouldn't. Everyone goes the opposite and goes, oh, God, if they made a car with the entire top lifted off, I'd have that because I've got children. It's easier to get them in. But Yeah, yeah, she had, they had Capris. And, what, and this was in the early 80s. And she said around about Knight Rider coming out, he had one and it wasn't even black. It was like, I don't know, blue. And all the kids down that road, like, used to call it Kit. <laughs> which I still think <laughs> I still giggle because it's like yeah. well it sounds like Kit they're definitely calling it something <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think they were all Mark II Capris with the, which was the slightly more sorry looking one I always think yeah they're a bit wasn't it they're a bit, yeah there's something a bit damp about those they're just they've got sorry eyes a little well, bit sorry you know the leading edge of the bonnet on those Mark II's and then on the Mark III, Capri's has that sort of chamfer on it, so it, it curves down to um, the, the leading edge. I know about the chamfer. Yeah, I know that about the chamfer. was done by uh, car designer Peter Stevens, who went on to do the McLaren F1 famously and facelifted the Lotus Esprit rather well and all that malarkey. But yeah, he was part of the team that did that car and put the um, <laughs> chamfer on the leading edge of the bonnet. And even he said, I remember reading once in an interview, that... He thought it was a bit of a crappy feature until the Mark III came along and they put the round headlights in and then it made it look quite tough and aggressive. It's exactly true. The chamfer over the top of the rectangular lights on a Mark II Capri is cack. Didn't work. Capris just work better with round lights, don't they? Because the the, the RS3100s and all that had the round lights, I think, and they just look so much cooler. They look so much better. Exactly. Exactly. But there's a period of time, I think, in car design when a square and rectangular lights became sort of technically possible and affordable and lots of car companies embraced them with gusto, even though in many cases they looked a bit shite. <laughs> well, that that sort of lozenge-shaped light, which the Mark I Capri had, is was shared across so many other cars, like the Austin Allegro or the Hillman Hunter and you name it. It was just a Lucas unit, which everyone didn't... I get the impression nobody really wanted to use it, but Lucas had pressed the button and gone, well, unfortunately, we've got a factory with... 3.6 million of these yeah so they've got to go somewhere lads yeah. <laughs> yeah a lot of those generic sealed beam headlights were made in a factory in the east midlands which was later sold to weetabix oh and for many years weetabix was made there instead of headlights true fact uh well weetabix is currently made in um it's not kettering it's the place next corby, door to isn't it, it? Called. is it corby burton latimer that's what it is which is like a small town next to Corby. 
Burn um, Latimer. I always think it I'm sounds... I'm Burton Latimer. Ex- ex- exactly. I used to drive Ford Capris until I realised they made me look like a <laughs> Burton Latimer is the kind of guy who would... Um, he used to do instructional videos. Uh, he used to saloon car race, and then when all that dried up, just did government instruction videos. Police. Oh, that's okay. what That's who he is. He's yeah, that guy. I... I thought Burton Latimer was a bit more... I'd almost see Burton Latimer as someone who solves crimes and he wears a black roll neck. Oh, he's a PI. Burton Latimer, you're telling me the butler was off duty the time <laughs> the crime was committed? This doesn't ring true. To the Capri. It's product placement. that he. It didn't really suit the character, but it was the 70s and Ford were very hot on product placement. So oh, they were massively the production hot. A Capri Massive. and he had, to, he had to drive around in it. Burton Latimer. At but it was service. not a high. It was not a high end one, was it? So all you got <laughs> so was 1.3 you, you got you got you got absolutely got just endless sidestepping uh, at six thousand rpm off the clutch just to induce a little bit of axle tramp to make it look like there was action in the footage. I think one of Burton Latimer's catchphrases was "Blast! They're getting away." <laughs> Entirely based on his one point three liter Capri. Well, a single choke carb, isn't it? Aren't you going to chase them, Mr Latimer? There's simply no point. <laughs> Resistance isn't futile. Yeah. They they had to they rewrote it was one of those sort of Lou Grade productions, like ATV things, and they, they they rewrote the entire series after the Capri was secured, so that Latimer became much more cerebral. And this was entirely to allow him to let people get away. Tortoise and hair style knowing full well that the crims in a knackered old Mark II Jag, driving like maniacs, would simply crash at some point and he would be able to go and apprehend them at oh, his leisure in okay. the slow Capri. That, but they, but they, they, sort of, they rewrote the scripts to accommodate that because originally there were a lot of car chases and then they went, oh, it's not going to work, is it? Because of the, because of the low power. The Capri in, in modern time has become quite cool uh, thanks to Harry Styles from... Uh, that band that I've just totally forgotten the name of One Direction um, One Direction you've got to be careful how you say that um, I've got a couple more questions here actually um, yes one is uh, from uh, again these are on Twitter Robert Venn uh, hello Robert okay. big fan of your diagrams he asks I found myself wondering whether either of you had driven a McLaren F1 um, and the answer is no I haven't have you no sadly I have never um I haven't. Um, I've sat in one. Yeah, I've sat in one as well. Does that count? <laughs> no, it probably doesn't. No. But there's a small chance I will get the chance to drive one in the next 12 months. What? But we'll see. We'll You're see. kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I don't just I don't just spout this kind of stuff on a, on a podcast for nothing. But that's... No, it's, wow, it's a okay. It's a chance. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that very much so. It's either that or a, it's either that or a Matra Bagheera. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it's a McLaren F1. Was it the Bagheera <laughs> that was the three seater? I can't remember. Yeah, but not not a central driving position. I think I think maybe they did a prototype like that. But I think that the it was three seats, but like a multiple where the, the wheel is still handed. That's true. It's still handed. Absolutely. Sorry, Robert Venn. That was a really disappointing answer to your question. But we have answered the question, and that's the it, main it, thing. It was. Yeah, I've got a question for you. That's not. I didn't put it through social media or anything. I'm just going to ask you. Yeah. CVT or DVT? Which one's worse? <laughs> Continuously variable transmission or deep vein thrombosis? Or oh, deep vein throm- <laughs> deep vein thrombosis? Which one is less desirable? And you've got to be honest here. Well, I've I've never had deep vein thrombosis. Yeah. Um, and I <clears> have <throat> driven cars with CVT gearboxes, and they made me want to suffer a restriction of the major blood vessels of the body <laughs> leading ultimately to my death <laughs> so what you're saying is I'm going to call it evens I'm going to call it even. I was going to say I don't think there's a big winner there there's not a there's not <laughs> no, outstanding a winner <laughs> <laughs> okay alright that's great okay, good All question right, though okay. thanks um uh, another one on Twitter, S. Kennedy asks, uh, having listened to this latest podcast and its brief mention of Bristol's, which we were talking about last week, weren't we? Of course. I was wondering if either of you had ever met LJK Setright. Would love to hear your reminiscences if you did, or even made up stories if you didn't, using appropriately drawn out vocabulary. 
I'm afraid I didn't. Um, I was a bit young, and I certainly wasn't a journalist when. Um, by the time I became in this, got into this game, he was well out of it. I think so. Um, no, I, I, I mean I can try and make up something. I, I, I don't know if that's a good idea though. <laughs> you? Right. Did you yeah. meet him? I never met him, but I spoke to him on the phone. Did you? Yeah, my first job at the BBC doing the Cars, the Star. Oh, what a show. Yeah, they were nice shows, though. They, they were, were good, good to shows. Work on. And I was doing, the very first one I did was about the larder. And yep. it's old school. We had an internet computer in the office. Brilliant. Which is a dedicated separate terminal on which you could go and look at things on the internet. And it was 1998. So the internet was, as one of my colleagues went, it's just CFAX for your computer. So <laughs> there was a lot more old school phone bashing. Which is which is a no bad thing. I felt no, like it's that not. Might, I mean, it's might good. have a bit of a renaissance. You can get a lot more said in a short space of time. So I was doing phone bashing, and there was a book. I think it was the what's it called the that um, uh, Guild of Motoring Writers. You know that organisation that yes, that, um, you can be in if you're a car journo. Yeah, and in those days they used to publish a little hardback book which had everyone who was a member. It had all their contact details in it. Brilliant. Love and I that. was looking through it, and basically looking through it and going, oh, my God, they've got, like, the home address of all these people I've been reading in car magazines, you know, sort of thinking, oh, my God, because they're kind of superstars to me. You know, they, I treat them as, like, they're famous people. I, I, I can't believe they've got Roger Bell's home address in here. But sort of now I find that less remarkable because, <laughs> you know, they, they are, in fact, just people. But <laughs> it had Leonard LJK Setwright's details in it, including, I think, his home number, because I rang him. Home? Oh, landline. I just, oh, yeah, a oh, full landline. Oh, that's great, great, great. So I just rang him up and said, hello, my name's Richard Porter. I'm calling from the Cast of Star at BBC Pebble Mill. And I, I wondered, as a long-standing car journalist, if you uh, remembered much about when the deal was done with Fiat, which led to the creation of Lada and, and or Vaz, whatever they're really called, um, and, and your Vaz. early recollections of driving the car. And he was absolutely brilliant. He was charming, and he gave me loads of time. He just chatted, and he, he, his recollections, you know, and, and he sort of gave me some pointers about things they did to the engineering of the Fiat design to make it into the the car that the Russians made. And um, he was absolutely great. And it was, you know, that's the thing, never meet your heroes. I'd never even talk on the phone to your heroes. But he was, because uh, I, always, I always liked his stuff. I found it sometimes a bit impenetrable, and I thought sometimes he would, possibly slightly taking the piss particularly in yeah. retrospect having read his stuff now I kind of go, i think sometimes he's laying this on thick just because he can it's a bit lavish yeah yeah, 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 yeah. it's a bit lavish yeah, it's, a bit, it's like he's done a few sort of squiggly bits on it unnecessarily um much though but a lot of his writing is really good but um but he was he was one of those people who wrote for car magazine when car magazine was just the best magazine in the world as far as I was concerned and so he was he was still a hero and to speak to him and to find that he was extremely nice and for nothing more than just out of sheer politeness and goodness of his heart he gave me a load of time on the phone to help me out I thought it was mega so and I never met him but I spoke to him on the phone and he was great the end brilliant well I can't I can't really add to that um but I think he definitely his work influenced an awful lot of us and uh There'll be other people. Talking of landlines, I got. I'm sure you've got it. I've got Tiff's landline number because Tiff's at home. His mobile phone doesn't work. Oh yes, I'd forgotten about that. So, so when you phone him, his answer machine message says, "If this has gone straight to answer machine, there's every chance that I'm at home. In which case, here's my home number." And you just phone it, and it him or his wife answers, and it feels like you've suddenly rewound time twenty five years. It's brilliant. It feels intrusive these days, ringing people at home, doesn't it, on a landline? Yeah. It's like you, you, it's like you might as well just walk straight into their house without being asked. It's, it's odd. It does. Yeah, it used to be sort of normal that you would do that because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get hold of it. Totally the normal. Um, I was going to say, there's, there's um, two things about LJK Setright that I was going to say. Is that one, you know, in his later years working at Car Magazine, he used to quite often be pictured in the magazine. You know, they do it. And even on the cover, he'd sometimes turn up. He was at least one issue. He was on the cover. Um testing some luxury saloons and in his later years he used to dress in a very distinctive basically he just sort of like dressed like the chief rabbi where he'd have <laughs> the full like yarmulke on and and his he had the big beard and he'd wear that vest thing that i can't remember what it's called and and he'd become quite devout 
to his Jewish faith in his later years. Yeah. But what I found out subsequently is that before that, he basically used to like to experiment with different looks. At different points in his life, he would just adopt a look. So the full Rabbi Setright look was a later life thing that he adopted wholesale. But in the 70s, apparently, he used to just walk around wearing tennis kit. And, and there were other looks that he experimented with as well. He was tennis? proper eccentric. Yeah, he used to dress like a tennis. He used to just wear tennis whites. Well, that's just brilliant. I think someone told me he even used to carry a tennis racket under his arm, even though he had no intention of playing tennis. It was just part of the look. I mean, I, I went to run to the sun once in the late 90s. And we, me and my mates just used to have a competition. There'd be a couple of you know nights out where there's like music in the big top and all that stuff and we'd we'd always try and pick offensive clothes to outdo one another and on one year I went to a second hand in charity shop and found new old stock I'd suppose it was mid 70s tennis gear but it was all in one size too small for me but I bought it all anyway because it was mint <laughs> and it was so uncomfortably tight and man made but I just thought bollocks I'm, I, I bought it and wore it that most of that weekend drinking scrumpy it was fun lots of and we were riding girls bicycles that with the folding frames you know the ones that fold in the middle yes to put in the boot of a car well we we my mate brought three of them because he'd found them on a tip and he took the center pin out of all of them so you'd have to ride them and the faster you pedaled the bike started to un oh my god unhook un <laughs> And after 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 a cluster of cans of cider, this was a very technical ride. I'm I'm riding with a bending bike, wearing full tennis gear. I mean, it's a sight to behold. Luckily, social media didn't exist back then. <laughs> yeah, happy times. Happy. I was going to say innocent times, but not innocent. But happy times. The state of your clackers after that. Jesus. Well, yeah, there was a state of a lot of things. Hey, um, just before we started to chat, I I I got a um, a thing came up on my phone this morning of uh, you know uh, YouTube videos that you subscribe to, and one of them is called VHS Rallies, which I'm sure you've seen. Mm. Old seventies and eighties and nineties rally footage, and the reason why I'm telling you this. One popped up this morning, a 1993 rally, Ewa Kankinen in a Celica with Nicky Greist as the um, co-driver. And he's it's on board camera and he's fully on it with the pace notes being read by Nicky Greist. Is it Greist? Grist? Yeah, I think Grist. I mean, it could be either, but like Jesus Christ, but... All right, OK, Cr- Grist. Anyway. Anyway, um, as I was watching it and... He Nicky was reading out the notes. My phone that I was watching it on, the eBay alert ping went off. Do, do you know the the eBay kind of jingle? Yes. It sort of goes diddle ding, and I it yeah. didn't bring up a menu. It just pinged in the background. And for a second, I thought it was on the video I was watching. And I thought, I thought, hang on. I thought, hang on, Nikki, Nikki and you are like mid-rally, mid-stage, really on it, like moments from destroying hedges and Salikas. And suddenly Nikki's phone goes off and it's like, oh, hang on a minute, I'm bidding on something, on a, a, an old Welsh dresser on eBay. I need to quickly put a cheeky bid in. And it suddenly made me burst out laughing. Uh, and then I realised, no, it's my phone. It, those f- smartphones weren't invented in 1993, so it was just total bobbins. <laughs> Left over crest into tight 95 and up to £75 for Nest of Tables. <laughs> it's a Nest of Tables, exactly what it is. Yeah, bloody Nest of Tables, I hate them. That's probably a good place to wrap things up for this week. But if you like this, we put a new one up every Monday morning. And if you want to see us talking nonsense, we have a, a vast archive of Smith & Sniff videos on YouTube. So go and look at those or have a look at Johnny's Car Pervert channel, which is him doing excellent things on his own. Has that covered everything? <laughs> I think that's 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 pretty good, actually. Oh, and if you like this podcast, can you leave a comment and a, a score? Because... I love reading the comments. They're actually way better than this podcast itself. The comments are good. Yeah, we like the comments. Thank you for your generous and kind comments and scores. And we will see you for one of these next week. Thank you, please. Bye. Goodbye.